Hey there, and welcome to your video on topics 4.1 through 4.3 in Unit 4. We're going to be covering plate tectonics, soil formation, and soil composition properties. All right, this first unit is um, not a whole lot to it. Um, the first thing to take a look at is right here on page 305, um, which is the, um, the different eras and periods. Please don't know a whole lot about this. Um, the first thing to take a look at is uh, which era or eras were the five mass extinctions. It's right here, Mesozoic and Paleozoic. Um, we think we're gearing up for a six mass extinction here in our current era of the Cenozoic era. Um, please also note that we are in the Quaternary period. All right, core, mantle, asthenosphere, crust. Boy, I have mantle here twice, sorry about that. And uh, lithosphere. So um, let's <clears throat> see if there's a better picture. Um, I do think that the pictures that you've got in your notes are probably better than this. Um, but core is the hard, uh, when you do a cross section of the earth, the core is the hottest part. Um, then you have the, uh, the mantle, that is the semi-liquid uh, rock area. Um, the asthenosphere is the, the very top of that. And then your crust is um, part of that is your um, is your lithosphere right here a combination of the crust and the rigid rigid outermost part of the, part of the mantle is a lithosphere so that is going to be um, what your tectonic plates are um, <laughs> excuse me what your tectonic plates are made out of um, what element is the core mostly comprised of it is mostly iron in here um, how does convection work? Super simple. Convection is the transfer of heat via some other, um, uh, some sort of substance. It's going to be usually air or water, or in this case, lava, or excuse me, magma. Um, super hot. Uh, magma gets super hot. Hot things rise. As it rises, it cools off, which means it eventually sinks. So you have these circular um, motions of, um, of the lava that cause the, um, uh, eventually as we're gonna talk about the tectonic plate movement. Uh, again, this is very much like uh, bubbling gravy for the same reason. Um, uh, also be aware of this because that's also how um, winds work. <laughs> there are air convection currents you're gonna to need to know about. Um, what's the difference between magma and lava? Um, magma is under, is uh, this, uh, semi-liquid uh, rock underground and then when it comes out the top of a volcano or out of a crack in the crust it's called lava so magma lava um, differentiate between igneous sedimentary and metamorphic rock and explain how each is formed um, we've got a no nice rock cycle over here um, oh by the way this was not a question i specifically listed there but it is definitely something you need to know from uh, your in-class notes and also in here Please be aware of the fact that continental cru or oceanic crust is mostly um, made out of a rock called, where is it in here? Hmm, I must have seen it on the other page. Um, uh, in your in-class notes, uh, one is made of basalt and one is made of granite. Please make sure that you look that up. Um, it's in the lower right-hand corner of the, um, the cross-section of the earth. All right, um, rock cycle. Uh, when it comes, when, when lava cools, that is called igneous rock. Um, uh, great examples of that is granite and basalt. Um, uh, it's shiny, no, no fossils. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, sedimentary rock is when you have, um, the, the rock is broken down into sediment through weathering then you have um, uh, some heat, but mostly pressure uh, uh, pushes it together and causes it to stick. Um, it's stratified. This is where you mostly find fossils. Um, again, sandstone and limestone are two great examples. And then um, uh, metamorphic rock is, is high heat and pressure. Um, either this, this, or other forms of this squeeze together so you have these big, thick bands of, of minerals in here and then also next to no pores. I mean, think about it. You've taken all of this stuff and shoved it together so there's no air spaces left between it. Um, marble, 
Um, some forms of slate are also sedimentary. That's why I'm kind of reluctant to call it that. Nice, remember it's a nice rock. Um, those are some great examples as well. Um, I will remind you again, there, uh, there's reading you can do up here on um, uh, igneous, uh, right here, uh, sedimentary and um, metamorphic. Remember that, again, granite and basalt are what make up all of the um, plates and uh, uh, tectonic plates on our planet. All right, topic 4.2, uh, actually 305 to 307, uh, 323 through 328. Huh. Oh dear, I completely forgot to put in, okay, you guys got lucky. Um, I will be adding some things to your book. Um, uh, please be aware of um, uh, questions on continental drift and the three types of boundaries. Uh, you're going to notice I neglected to put any questions um, in your, your packet, but uh, uh, your, in your textbook, but we did talk about it in class, so definitely be aware of the difference between convergent, divergent, and transform. Um, know what a volcano is. Understand that the Hawaiian Islands are... Um, uh, hot spot. Um, you know, be aware of what the plates do. Uh, transform faults. Uh, remember that you have converge. It can either be mountain building or you have the subduction zone, and then divergent is where the plates move away from each other. Um, let's see what else. Look, I'll, I'll give you specific questions for you to study for your unit test. Um, I can't believe I forgot that stuff here. Um, so. Understand what a tsunami is. That is where you basically have an earthquake on the ocean floor and it causes a wave that creates a wall of water that um, is very problematic. You can see you can see that occurring here and you can see some of the damage um, that occurs. Earthquakes are the same way. I don't know that we'll be able to watch those videos in class. I highly recommend that you watch some that I've posted so that you really understand the, um, the devastation that's involved um, with those. But again, you, even though I don't have specific questions, in there, definitely no um, uh, events that are, are um, associated with each of these. You can have earthquakes across the boat board, but transform is mostly known for those. Uh, you have mountain building here. This is seafloor spread. Um, when I ask you things on the quiz, you'll um, it'll be very obvious what it is that I mean. So again, I apologize that I left those questions off. I'll get you some to study before the test. So topic 4.2, you have 70 through 72. All right, so basically all you need to know is what soil is. Soil is composed of two things. You basically have rock that has been ground up in the itty bitty pieces, but then you also have organic material in there that uh, provides nutrition that uh, organisms like plants use in order to survive. And then you do also have things that live, um, live in the soil, little bugs, uh, bacteria, uh, worms, all those little guys. Um, do be aware that um, most of the nutrition in the world's soil is within the top inch of the topsoil. Um, so you can replenish it, but boy, it takes a long time. So if it washes into the ocean, as an example, because of soil erosion, uh, you're not going to get that back for a long time. I'm going to remember if you don't have nutritious soil in the ground, you don't have plants that grow and, um, you know, we don't have crops, stuff like that. Um, all right. So three, um, uh, plant cover keeps soil in place. Um, think about it, what part of the plant anchors the soil in place? That's going to be the roots. Um, that's going to become important when we talk about agriculture. There are some forms of protecting the soil that allow you to cut plants down, but then if the roots are still in place, they kind of anchor the soil in place at all. Uh, and, and, and they anchor the soil in place. Um, all right, so, <laughs> excuse me, 308 to 309. So... How does soil become bedrock? Basically just effort. Um, you have uh, physical weathering, chemical weathering. Physical weathering can either be uh, critters, um, which is called biotic weathering. Um, it's also sometimes called biological weathering. Um, so you have things like lichen and moss um, breaking rock down, especially during primary succession into smaller bits, at which point that you have um, other plants come in over time and accelerate that process. You can see um, you start with bedrock and um, move forward, and the, the soil becomes 
um, more mature. You can see that the colors become more varied. We're gonna talk about what those colors are, <coughs> excuse me, in just a little bit. Um, so physical weathering is right here. You have wind, ice wedging. Um, that would be where water goes into a crack, it freezes, cracks the rock open. Um, chemical weathering occurs when slightly acidic rain um, reacts with the minerals to um, basically uh, bring nutrients out into um, versions that uh, plants can uptake. Remember, some is good, too much is bad, which is why anthropogenic uh, acid rain is a bad thing because it can actually take those uh, nutrients and instead of making them available. It just basically does what's called mobilizes them and just moves them uh, out of the soil entirely as, as water washes them away. Um, we already talked about the difference between physical and chemical weathering of rock. Biological weathering of rock, again, is... Um, uh, referred to in the notes that we took as biotic weathering, a form of physical weathering. It just means you have a living critter um, doing the work of grinding up this rock into smaller bits. Um, all right, so what is humus? Uh, please know the difference between humus and hummus. Hummus is a kind of dip made out of chickpeas. Humus is um, a uh, is a kind of um, uh, dead and decaying um, uh, stuff, for lack of a better word, that um, uh, helps, uh, that needs to break down a little bit further to help enrich the soil. Um, you need to understand that topsoil and humus are two totally different things. Um, I'm just trying to look for where humus is. I wonder if I saw it somewhere else. Just hold on a second, kiddos. Um, um, I am not seeing where humus is. As soon as I stumble across the word, I'll show you in the book where the definition is. Oh, here it is. As soon as I was looking for it, there it is. Humus, the partially decomposed organic material from plants and animals that mixes with parent material. Do not confuse humus with enriched topsoil because it's, it's this stuff on the top that's starting to decay. It hasn't fully decayed and integrated itself with the top inch or two of the soil. Um, you may notice that there are what's starting to look like layers in a layer cake. That's gonna become important here in just a minute, so hold that thought. All right, so let's see. Um, figure 11.6 describes soil in the five types of biomes. Um, this should come as no surprise. Um, not a lot of nutrition in desert areas in the soil. Um, uh, it is um, because it doesn't support a lot of plant life. Grasslands where there is, a, you know, just all kinds of vegetation, lots of humus. Please take note that the two um, soil types that are acidic are the tropical rainforest and um, the coniferous forest, which are also called the boreal forest also called the taiga of the two. This one is going to be more acidic because these leaves actually make their own um, basically pesticide to keep other things from growing except for them. They, uh, the leaves not only makes it too bitter for uh, animals to eat the leaves when they drop, they then make the soil too bitter for um, or too acidic for other plants to grow. Um, that's called allelopathy. I believe I explained that in your um, notes. Allelopathy can be any sort of toxin that a plant produces that makes it so other organisms either don't eat it or don't grow in that particular area. It's like chemical warfare for plants. Um, identify the major soil horizons. Um, if we haven't gotten to them in class, you're only responsible for these. If we have added the extra layer, then um, you need to fold that in as well. But the layers are pretty easy. From top to bottom, it goes O, A, B, C. O is the leaf litter. A is the layer that is the uh, most important, that is where all the nutrition is. You can see that's where all the root systems mostly are. Um, B is subsoil, that means it's starting to develop in the soil, and then C is the parent material, it's the bedrock that's down here. Um, let's see what else. Um, we're gonna have a, a horizon E. Um, all right, what is the fertile upper, uppermost layer of the soil called? Again, it's called topsoil, it's layer A. Layer O, the humus, is not the most fertile layer because it hasn't decomposed enough to release its nutrients into the soil for plants to get at. 
All right, um, so let me get to Soil Horizon, which is what, where I was before, uh, 348 and 350. Okay. So again, we talked about what topsoil is. <coughs> Excuse me. Soil erosion, the movement of soil components, especially surface litter and topsoil, from one place to the other through the actions of wind and water. Again, this is really important when we start talking about agriculture in our next unit because a lot of times farmers will um, cut everything down and prep it for planting, but then for a variety of reasons let it sit there. So think about it. It's rains, it's windy, and um, in the places where we farm in the middle of the state, it's very windy. That's all the tornadoes are. That means all of the part of the soil that um, helps plants to grow blows away. And if it washes away, um, especially into um, lakes and oceans, those nutrition that nutrition is gone and it can take a very long time for this to um, replenish itself. Um, so let's see, how does it happen? I already talked about it. Three types of flowing water that cause soil erosion. Um, we've got sheet, uh, rill, and then <laughs> gully. And gully is going to be um, uh, the worst of the three. Basically, here's here's how it is. Sheet, you just have a layer of water kind of passing across. Rill is when you have, um, it starts carving furrows, which is like little divots in the soil. And then a gully is when it's just really, really big. Um, so in the scheme of things, I don't think that you're going to need to know those. I just wanted to introduce the words just to make sure just realize that um, water, especially water along a sloped area where gravity can kick in, can quickly take all the topsoil and take it somewhere else where you can't get at it anymore from a, um, especially from an agricultural perspective. Um, let's see, what keeps soil protected from uh, water and wind erosion? Again, roots in the, in the, in the ground. Um, okay, so here you can see differences in um, Soil erosion, you can see where it's become gully and it's just whole chunks of the earth are gone. If all of this was planted with these plants, this would have never happened um, because those roots keep the soil from going anywhere. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, you see plants being planted on the side of um, uh, where they build bridges for roads. Um, it's also why it's important to not cut forests down completely, not just because of things that live there, but also those, those roots, keep, roots keep the soil in place. Also think about it when we talk about water pollution. This is a main source of water pollution. You can make the water too dirty to drink, especially in areas where um, you don't have any water treatment plants, um, meaning that they don't have any way of cleansing the water. Um, how does a loss of soil fertility lead to erosion? It's basically a positive feedback loop. Think about it. Um, water comes in, washes the topsoil away. Um, plants can't grow any, there anymore. That means there are no roots to hold the soil in place more water comes and washes the topsoil away. So it's just this, um, this positive feedback loop that uh, accelerates itself. Um, so that is the end of 4.2. Um, 4.3 is 310 through 311. So let's take a look. Okay, so we're back here. Um, this is also some important stuff. We're more fully explain um, o, A, B, and C. Guys, you can read this for yourself. It starts right here, the importance of soil nutrition. So you can see they talk about A all through here. <coughs> um, also, uh, in terms of being homes for uh, habitats for other organisms, um, those are important because um, the, um, the air spaces they leave behind, roots in order to do their thing need a little bit of air. Um, if roots are completely covered up in water and soil, they can't absorb nutrients, um, they can't perform uh, respiration, and they die. That's why if you overwater a plant, it kills it. Um, so definitely read all that. You can see humus helps to hold water in place and slowly releases the, um, the roots needed. Oh look, the nitrogen cycle is back. So, um, and then healthy soil can also <coughs> serve as a source of evaporation to release some of that water back into the atmosphere. This is important. The color of topsoil indicates how useful it is for growing crops. 
um, the darker the darker it is, the more um, nutrients it has in it, and the more likely it is to support uh, the vigorous growth of plants. And then, the, in the case of crops, um, uh, healthy crops. B horizon and C horizon, as all talked about here, the biggest difference is that it doesn't have that nutrition level that um, uh, the A does. So I mean, imagine how that that is. So let's say this is the A layer. You've got nutrition coming in from decomposing humus up here, and then you have the actual um, physical components of the soil being slowly broken down this way. So that topsoil layer is kind of the sweet spot between those two um, uh, actions happening. All right, so um, uh, another word for the sea horizon again is bedrock. This is important. Three kinds of soil particles, sand, silt, and clay. Um, be familiar with the sizes of them. Sand is the smallest by a long shot, then you have silt, and then you have clay. Um, so uh, be able to rank them in size. I just went over that. Explain how clay is important, is important to nutrient retention. There is this right here, um, nutrient holding capacity. If you look, particles of clay, <laughs> know this, have a negative charge. And so um, magnets of opposite charges, as you, as you know, attract each other. So if the clay is negative, it attracts nutrient ions, as you can see, with a positive charge. That's calcium and potassium. Um, so um, most, not all nutrients, because if you look, nitrate ions are negative. Um, but most, um, uh, well, not most, but all metallic um, elements uh, form ions with a positive charge. Um, and the clay, just because it's naturally and negatively charged, it holds on to this stuff, which means the roots can go into the clay and pluck away the... Um, the nutrients that it needs when it needs it. So having clay in soil um, means that it holds on to nutrients. Um, let's see. <laughs> Differentiate between infiltration and retention. It's not defined here, but infiltration means um, uh, water can pass through it. I mean, think about sand. Uh, think about your, uh, your eco columns. Uh, the water just flows right through sand. Retention of water is um, holding on to it. So um, some soils allow more water to run through and then some soils hold on to the water a lot. How do we know that? It is a um, it is the proportions of the sand, the silt, and the clay that tells us that. Um, and then porosity and permeability. So um, porosity is a measure of the open spaces within a soil and then permeability is um, how well water can flow through. So if you have uh, high porosity, you're going to have high permeability. Low porosity, low permeability. Um, so this is definitely something to know. Clay has a very low permeability. Um, uh, uh, make sure that you compare sand and clay. Silt is always going to have middle properties. So definitely know how these three types of um, particles hold on to water or let it flow through. So sand has high porosity. <laughs> that means it's also going to have high permeability. If you have a um, tube full of sand and you pour water in one side, it's just going to flow right through to the other. You have clay and you pour water on it, it's just going to sit there forever. Why? Because those sand particles are very big and those clay particles are very, very small. So there's less, uh, for the clay, there's less space in between the particles for water to flow through. Sand, on the other hand, uh, uh, big particles when they stack up like uh, basketballs in a net, <laughs> lots of space in between them, water flows right through. Silt, because it is the medium sized particle, is, is in the middle of, of those two um, particles in terms of porosity and permeability. Um, okay, so what can, what can the feel of the soil tell you about the composition? Um, how much of each thing is in there? If it's very silky, I don't know if anybody's ever used clay in like a ceramics class, um, but it's it's very silky in feel. Why? Because those particles are really small. Sand is what we call very gritty because you can literally feel those big particles. So the feel of the particles can tell you about the um, the composition of the soil. So if the soil feels gritty, ah, lots of sand um, with uh, high porosity and high permeability, that means that water flows through it very readily, which means the stuff that grows there doesn't need a lot of water to survive, and as a matter of fact, likes its roots dry. If you have soil and you feel it and it feels very silky, ah, lots of clay. Clay particles have a high porosity and a high permeability. 
um, uh, it holds on to water, doesn't let it flow through very well. Therefore, the plants that grow in um, high clay soil uh, like having their roots moist at all times and need lots of water in order to survive. So understanding the, the um, and also um, uh, they need a lot of nutrients because there's a lot of clay in there and um, that clay, remember, is negatively charged and holds on to positively charged um, uh, ions that are, are nutrients for plant growth. So be able to make those connections. When, uh, when we do our soil lab, this is one of the things you'll be doing is you will be determining um, the properties of soil just by um, doing some manipulatives with it. Um, so that concludes 4.1 through 4.3. Again, I apologize for not having more questions about the three types of um, boundaries, but definitely be able to tell the difference between convergent, divergent, transform. Understand that while earth, uh, earthquakes can happen with all of them, they're largely associated with transform. Uh, with convergent, you have either mountain building or subduction. Um, and then uh, divergent is usually associated with seafloor spread. When you have convergent, it means that side of the plate is getting smaller um, because it's either turning into a mountain or it is being um, recycled back into the magma. So remember, subduction looks like this. Um, divergent plates means that you have uh, magma rising the lava where it hardens and that edge of the plate is getting bigger. Um, okay, so that is the end of that section.